All right. Well, welcome everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, so this is panel 13, um, Electoral Laws and Institutions. I'm Laurel Harper Jong from Northwestern University in Illinois in the United States. Um, and I'm gonna be sharing discussant duties today with Sam Powers from Sussex University. Um, so in terms of the program today, we're gonna be going through the order that's listed on the website program. So it's gonna be first um, Bernard Tomas, followed by Felipe Carlos Betancourt Hergardo, um, then Anna Friedrich Depka and Carolina Rokika Merzweski. I apologize if I messed your name up there. Um, followed by Luisa Martin Santos and Henry Bori, um, Joseph Claver, and then and the last paper is David Levine and Christina Zorka. Um, and I can go ahead and put that in the chat as well so that we have it and everyone knows who's up next. As a reminder, the presenters each have 10 to 15 minutes to present, and then Sam and I will provide some comments. And if other people have audience questions, feel free to add them in the chat throughout, or at the end, we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A as well. Um, I'll give in the chat um, a brief heads up when you've got five minutes left, so when you're at 10 minutes. Um, and otherwise, let's go ahead and take it away. So the floor is yours, Bernard. Thank you. All right, I'm, I'm hoping everyone can see this properly. Uh, my name is Bernard Tomas. I'm from Valdosta uh, State University in, uh, in uh, the United States, in Georgia. And this presentation is about a new measure that I am developing for studying uh, gerrymandering. And it's a measure that's intended to resolve a, a few of the problems that current measures have and including being capable of moving into being used uh, more globally. In other words, not any, something that could be just specifically for the United States. So I'm going to explain how it works and I'm gonna talk a bit about uh, what it has shown so far on, on US elections and, and why it brings out information that we, I don't think had necessarily until this point. So I will get started with that. Uh, it's called the Reverse Gerrymandering Index, uh, uh, which for short is RGIX. So there are a lot of measures right now for gerrymandering. There is a huge number. There's a few uh, major ones, a few major types. And, and some of these major ones have some important limitations that we need to get around. I'll, I'll start with the middle one, which is probably the most best known, which is where uh, researchers study the shape of districts, that if districts are not compact, if they don't look like squares or like circles, but if instead they look like, like uh, mushed insects or like uh, frogs or something, then, then that would be assumed to be a gerrymandered uh, legislative district. Though actually, there are many other reasons why that's possible, which is a, a significant limitation in that. Uh, it doesn't necessarily show the impact on actual election results. The one on the left, the vote seat patterns, are, are ones, the main ones that we're attempting to get at how it uh, partisan gerrymandering is affecting outcomes. And here, and these are the ones I'm the most critical of, efficiency gap is a famous one. Uh, and what it does is it would measure the entire, every legislative district around across a country or across a state. And so it has a bad tendency to measure any form of variation across districts as if they're gerrymandering. And the final one, which is getting a lot of uh, work right now in, in, um, in among uh, methodologists is the Monte Carlo approach which is where they basically redraw districts over and over and over again and see how much current districts look like that, which is a great uh, uh, approach, assuming you can get the data for it, which is very unlikely if you're looking at historical data and probably historically, I mean, semi-authoritarian regimes are not about to be handing that kind of information out. So that kind of is a limitation there. I did wanna just show one early graph to show you where some of these problems are. So this is looking at the US House election since 1900. Uh, so over the last 120 years, and this is the efficiency gap, which is one of these ones that looks at, at, at vote seat patterns uh, across entire regions. 
And you'll notice that the numbers fly wildly high in the first half. This line in the middle, in U.S. Uh, electoral history, what happened was in the early 1960s, the Supreme Court uh, outlawed malapportionment and started forcing states to repeatedly redraw district lines. So this is an approximate point where gerrymandering started becoming serious. So what you should see is more gerrymandering on the, on the right, less gerrymandering on the left. And here, and this is this famous measure is actually showing the exact opposite. It is a very strong sign that this is, uh, it's problematic. You can also see that the numbers fly around wildly, which doesn't really make sense with gerrymandering. So just to give kind of a, an illustration, a sense of what the problem is that, that we're uh, dealing with here. So what happens is the underlying logic of the measure I'm uh, presenting and I'm developing is that the way to under understand gerrymandering is it's, it's in terms of partisan differences of districts next to each other. So it is always the relationship between a district and the district right next door, the adjacent districts. And probably the most important form of gerrymandering is something called packing, where what happens is that the supporters of one party are kind of pushed into one district, is drawn so they're heavily into one district. And then what happens is that the, um, the neighboring districts wind up having kind of different results. So I don't know how well you can see it here on the right if we're missing information, but North Carolina 12th was a famous example of this that most people in the US who study this know, where, where the district line was drawn in a way that it was 80% Democratic vote, uh, highly, highly African-American. And then the surrounding districts, the Democratic vote was just under 50%, which created a situation where the Democrats could like, uh, the, the Republicans would wind up winning a lot of seats, even though they only had about 50% of the support. So this is the thing we're going after, or I'm going after. Now, this measure, RGIX, what it effectively does is reverse the process or simulates what if we reverse the process, effectively moving votes back. So it runs a simulation where it moves, it kind of smooths the differences. So it kind of looks at, I'm going to go through this a couple of times, so it'll, it hopefully will make sense as we go, but it effectively takes takes um, these uh, randomly moves voters around so that it winds up, if a district is packed, then it winds up that those voters have been moved around to the old back effectively to other districts. Uh, if there's no gerrymandering, it just happens to be a very Republican or very Democratic state or very supported by whatever party, then it'll have no impact. But then what would happen is that the actual vote and the smooth vote would be different. And this would wind up producing an individual score for, the, uh, for each district. So what happens is some of these advantages are, first of all, and this doesn't exist for a lot of these measures, it creates a score for each individual district, which means you can do a lot with it from that point. You can use it various types of statistical approaches. Um, the scores, like I said, are influenced by local differences. It very smoothly handles small states and small countries, right? It doesn't, it, it, there's no other district around, then, then there's just no movement and the, the score comes out to zero. But, and one of the two of the things that I think are particularly important as we move past the US is that it doesn't require that much data. It only requires whatever the vote distribution is and a map so you can see how districts are next to each other. And this system, a lot of these measures assume a two-party system. This system can work easily and smoothly with a multi-party system. So this is what we're doing or what I'm doing. And I want to now go through it in slightly more detail. So the idea behind this is effectively to treat um, districts as if within the framework of graph theory. And if we look at this on the side here, we can see this is, this is your standard kind of graph. These circles are called nodes. We can consider those to be districts. And that these little lines here connecting them are called edges. 
And what happens is you also have this idea of traversing where what happens is you can have uh, movement from one vote to another, right? This, by the way, they're edges in this, this model if they happen to be next to each other. And what happens is the idea is what if we took those voters, we pretend that we look at them as like 10,000 different voters, and then we just randomly start moving them around. So it could be that, let's say at the third district, if we're taking those numbers and randomly moving them, uh, about a third of them would wind up in the fourth district, a third in the second, and the third would wind up stay in the first, which means that there's a big difference between these, what will happen is it'll smooth out those results. So to give an example, this is Louisiana. This is a current district. Uh, Louisiana, a, a state in the South. Uh, this is New Orleans. And this is a heavily gerrymandered district. Uh, and the rest of the state is very Republican. So it's a heavily Democratic uh, district. And we can see how it kind of gets translated in. This is the percent Democratic vote. And you can see how like the first and the sixth district, which is around the second, the second is the blue one, how much their, their, the vote difference is between these two, strongly indicating a gerrymandered district. And so what the RGIX does is with that moving it around, this kind of simulation of it, it smooths it and this, there's a significant drop in the percent vote uh, in the in the gerrymandered district, but if you look at the states, if we went back and forth, these numbers are practically the same as they were before. And the RGIX score, I got five minutes. I'll get to it. Uh, the RGIX score you can see is very low for these non-gerrymandered states. Okay, I'm going to go straight to the analysis. What I've done is look at it. Any RGIX score of at least ten percent. Uh, is considered to be a gerrymandered district, a highly packed district, with positive numbers being pro-Republican, negative numbers being pro-Democratic. And what you can see is, looking at this chart, there is it, it indicates that there was virtually no gerrymandering uh, up until the 1960s. And then there was a sharp shift towards the Republican Party. Uh, and has, which has been getting steadily stronger, which means Republicans right now, according to this measure, are massively gaining uh, an advantage through gerrymandering right now at the national level. Now, I had thought, like most would, looking at this, that, oh, this is a sense that the, the Republicans are gerrymandering and the Democrats are not, and it's not exactly that. Instead, what we have, this is separating the Democratic and the Republican gerrymanders. And some of the things that this is picking up is, first of all, going into the 1960s, we already had a rise before of the amount of gerrymandering before the Supreme Court even forced the issue, closer connected to the civil rights movement than to the actual law. And what you had was both sides, you know, the both sides argument, both sides were, were gerrymandering heavily going into around 1980. And then Democratic states, the amount of gerrymandering dropped dramatically, whereas for Republican states, it continued to be high. Even they have been a reducing in the amount. It's the difference between the two that is causing this significant bias in the Republicans' favor. And on top of that, and this is going to be the last of the graphs, again, you can really see in the South, so we look at the Southern, the previously Confederate states, what this graph is showing is that most of this bias towards the Republican Party has been being driven by the South. This is where most of the gerrymandering, not all, there is a Republican bias in other states like Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, but the huge effect has been especially in the South. So what the measure has done is also pinpoint, pinpoint a whole lot of things consistent with our basic knowledge of where gerrymandering is, the basic history, but also giving us information that we didn't really have before, not in this kind of detail. And so my hope on this is, this is kind of a starting point, I'm focusing on the US politics, but what I'm seeing is ways that this can be moved further. It's, it's again, we can look at it for simply identifying the amount of packed districts, 
but we could also use it to uh, creating skew scores, ways of looking at entire regions and showing how it is that they're, that they're influenced. One of the things that I hope to do and do soon is apply it beyond the United States. I'm particularly interested in, in the Hungarian case, uh, looking at it after the Orban regime, after Fidesz had taken charge. Um, there are ways of even, I don't have this written in, to have ways even of looking at it where you can isolate looking at just something like race, other democratic, uh, demographic factors, and the last thing is that I, what I want to do is make the data publicly available and create software to make it easy for people to, to use that. So this is the basic outline of, of where I'm heading on this. I'm interested to hear what anyone has to say. I've been getting good feedback in terms of have you considered this or that. So very much open and uh, looking forward to your comments. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, so we can go ahead and turn it over then to our second presenter, who is Felipe Carlos Betancourt Higareda. I'd like to go ahead and share your screen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let me share my screen. Uh, okay. Uh -huh. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to talk about what is going on in Mexico. I want to describe you in general terms. Uh, my presentation is quite descriptive, descriptive sorry. And, um, but I think it could help us to understand what's going on in regimes such as Mexico, where actually uh, there is a transition to to um, uh, well, there, there is a movement to strengthen authoritarian rules, but there is also a reaction from civil society to impede such transformation of authoritarian rules. So, um, well, um, so let me start by describing you um, what. Um, the different types of democracy that we're still living in, that we're still experiencing in Mexico. We can say that in Mexico, we, there are still civil liberties and political rights still in practice, although we are experiencing increasing opposition from the regime to these uh, opposing ideas of uh, the opposition. So, um, we have a represent. We also have some checks and balances among the three powers of uh, of the state, and there is a little uh, in the independence of the judiciary from the executive, and an independence that ha has been uh, intended to be compromised by the president, but luckily, luckily. Um, and the Supreme Court of Justice in Mexico has uh, hold, has held, sorry, uh, independent criteria to solve important issues for the country. What about deliberative democracy? We can say that in Mexico there is still public debate, um, especially through social media. I think social media is actually saving the world, not only Mexico. I think that public debate debate is very vibrant in social media and, uh, and has even triggered civic mobilizations and social movements in Mexico. So, um, and this has triggered as well participative democracy, which is, uh, but this kind of par participant democracy is a feature or characterized by uh, active social movement and civic mobilizations led by the remnants of the middle class. This middle class is particularly uh, hated or criticized by the current president who has accused the members of this class as snobs you know, or an any, and even enemies of the people. So we can see that the, the environment in Mexico has, be, has become more pro polarized. Uh, unfortunately, okay. 
um, sorry, um, I have problems with my presentation. Okay, what is my main argument? My main argument in this presentation is that, that the possibility of, of still exercising civil liberties and political rights in this country has encouraged the better performance of the checks and balances, that is, at least to have a, a representative democracy functioning. Um, but especially it has triggered the independence of the Supreme Court, so the Supreme, the Mexican Supreme Court of Justice. And how has this happened? Well, this has happened by the presence of more reflective public debate uh, in the public sphere, uh, basically through independent social media, who, which has triggered more active civic mobilizations and social, social movements. So, um, well, I got a model, a very simple model to explain why, how the status, the current status of electoral integrity in Mexico has been preserved. And well, the path that I have designed is that first of all, uh, the possibility of exercising civil liberties and political rights combined with the possibility of holding a public debate, a vibrant public debate, mainly through social media, mainly through Twitter, um, has all these has have triggered social movements and all these together, as you can see in my formula, has encouraged better checks and balances between the three powers of, uh, of the state. And this has led to the preservation of the, of the, of, of the current status of electoral integrity. So Mexico, has, uh, from my point of view, has remained uh, a semi-authoritarian state, partly free, uh, as many Englishes have uh, stated, has have declared. Uh, we have an improved, of course, our status of learning integrity, but luckily, uh, somehow they have not uh, worsened which was the main concern of many of people of many people in Mexico that with this current government, electoral integrity could have worsened to uh, very, very low levels. Um, but how, what has been the, uh, the causal process, the potential causal process that could have declined electoral integrity in Mexico? Well, uh, this is the path that the current president has followed to decline the electoral integrity in Mexico. He has attempted to corrupt the, the, the Supreme Power, the judiciary, especially the Supreme Court of Justice. Uh, he has uh, also corrupted and extortioned the Mexican Congress. He has also corrupted the main, main, main media, uh, press and broadcasting media. So, and he has tried to colonize the social media. So all these factors together, the corruption of the judiciary, the extortion and corruption of the Mexican Congress, the corruption of the press and broadcasting media, and his attempt of colonizing social media, well, could have actually affected um, this independence of the Supreme Court of Justice that has halted um, his electoral reforms. And otherwise, we have we, we, we would have experienced a decline of the status of electoral integrity. Um, and we have become an autocratic regime, just as other uh, regimes in Latin America. So, well, wh what were the main and, and constitutional challenge resources that were used or exercised by different political actors in Mexico, we can say that there were two. Well, I have, you have, you can see here more than two, but actually there were basically uh, two were, which were crucial, the constitutional controversy and the unconstitutionality action, which were exercised and for example, the constitutional controversy wa was exercised by the INE, which is the Ele Mexican Electoral Commission. And it was a very, very long uh, and 
deep wide uh, constitutional resource exercise. Uh, well, there are some numerals. The, uh, <clears throat> here we can see, well, it's written in Spanish, as you can see, but, uh, but they were like 174 uh, constitutional controversies uh, actually uh, presented, exercised by, by many, many uh, po uh, autonomous public bodies and, uh, and political actors and powers of state. And, and uh, there were also um, 15 um, inconstitutional actions exercised. So all of this, of course, it was overwhelming the quantity of, of challenges that were uh, exercised in order to override this and this uh, ref this electoral reform, this authoritarian electoral reform. Why this elec these electoral reforms would have um, affected the ele electoral integrity in Mexico if approved? They well, first of all, they would have collapsed the independence of the Mexican Electoral Commission through mandating popular vote for the selection of its councilors, and this is a demagoguery. This is, as you can see, I mean this apparently more democratic form of election of councillors would have been subject to manipulation, to arbitrary manipulation, especially by the uh, current uh, president. No? And of course, other, um, they would have undermined the capacity of the Mexican Electoral Commission of organizing free, fair, objective, trans transparent, and accurate elections through implementing budget and personal cuts to the Mexican Electoral Commission. And these would have undermined the capacity of this commission of controlling, mon monitoring, sanctioning those behaviors, actions, and decisions that could, have seriously, that could have seriously affected the freedom and the fairness of the electoral process. And lastly, they would have encouraged the impunity and the overall weakness of the rule of law. Of course, Mexico has a very weak rule of law, but this has weakened even more the rule of law. So, um, what? So, what? Where were the main points that the Supreme Court of Justice decided in this case? Well, that the liberty of democracy was at stake throughout the legislative pr procedure that led to the approval of the electoral reform. It's very. Uh, it was funny to see that and curious and very interesting to see that the Supreme Court that, that, that the Supreme Court of Justice in Mexico actually defended the liberty of democracy in Mexico. So it noticed that there were presence of traps, deceptions, impositions, irregularities during this the, the legislative procedure, which had invalidated consequences. And and for example, the lawmakers didn't, didn't, couldn't see what they were voting, incredibly, but, it, but that happened. Well, they, the traps of the, the president in order to impede the uh, lawmakers to know what they were voting, it was incredibly unseen before. And they didn't have the right to influence, they didn't have the right to influence the law decision process. And there was not a fairness during the law decision making process. There were no respect of the ideal speak situations. You know, the concept of, of Habermas, of discourse ethics and the fair aggregation of preferences, a concept that Jane, Jane Mansbridge uses a lot. So, well, you know, just to finish, um, just to finish, well, civic mobilizations and social movements can become serious obstacles for any authoritarian and transformation of electoral rooms. Um, they can neutralize the strategies of autocrats to pretend to undermine the due checks and balances between the three powers of the state, between the different levels of government, and between autonomous public bodies such as the Electoral Commission with these powers. And an importance of a middle class and educated in a middle class can become the most serious challenge to any autocrat to pretend to compromise the electoral integrity of his own country. And the greater and more educated, more proactive, more participate, participative middle class and civil society can preserve, preserve electoral integrity 
So, well, thank you very much for your um, listening and I look forward to your comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll go ahead and turn it over now to our third presenter, uh, which is the team of um, Anna and Carolina. Uh, yes, and one moment to my presentation. Okay, uh, my name is Karolina Rkicka-Murszewska and I'm from Nikolaus Copernicus University in Torun, Poland. Mm, and thank you very much uh, to the organizer for the opportunity to speak. Mm, this is a great honor for me and for my co-panelist, Dr. Anna Friedrich Depka. Unfortunately, I will be presenting on my own today because uh, Anna was called away by very urgent family matters. So she is very sorry for her absence today. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, electoral integrity uh, is a very broad concept. It includes more than uh, is expressed by the classically understood principles of law, law governing elections. The links between campaign, uh, campaign financing and election integrity are quite obvious and widely noted. So it is not surprising that in all democratic legal orders, um, the basic principle of law governing election campaign financing and more broadly, the financial activities of political parties is the principle of transparency. Adoption of this principle is a key element in ensuring the integrity of the activities of political parties. Um, equality, uh, equality of opportunity is understood uh, here as uh, equal uh, formal opportunities uh, to raise funds and ways of spending them. Uh, first, uh, in the aspects um, in the aspect of funding uh, from the state budget, which is most often based um, on the support reflected by the votes of voters in specific election. Secondly, in the aspect uh, of uh, of the willingness and wealth uh, of voters supporting a given en entity, which translates into the amount of uh, contribution. Um, a necessary element uh, crucial for, for ensuring equality of opportunity are regulations uh, relating to uh, the catalog of uh, entities that can finance political parties, uh, limits on contribution from supporters, the method of financing campaigns, also uh, the limit on election uh, campaign uh, expenditures. Uh, the uh, regulation on their own, uh, without ensuring proper control by independent body and shaping effective, um, yet not too harsh uh, sanctions for violation of certain rules and regulations, uh, will not ensure the integrity of elections. For a similar reason, transparency is uh, necessary with uh, regard to the financial issues of political parties and election campaign. Its provision is not only, only um, related to the transparency of the same, but the possibility of satisfying public curiosity. It, also, it is also a very important guarantee of integrity in the matter of question. Um, the mere existence of bodies set up for control, um, even the most specialized, uh, should not be the only fuse. As the examples of countries moving away from democracy show, institutions can easily be taken over, made inefficient uh, by, for example, um, reducing their budgets. Uh, it is enough to have um, a sufficient majority, constitutional or even um, absolute, to make monitoring uh, bodies uh, blows out. Um, under such circumstances, um, accessibility, openness of party finances and campaigning becomes the uh, sole opportunity to catch and present abuses, embezzlement or violation related to political financing. And um, on the screen, you have two examples of international regulations about it. 
Um, now, um, I would like to say what was our inspiration and, and why did we choose this topic. Um, in the end of 2021, uh, law on political parties was amended in Poland and the new obligations are to keep a um, uh, register of donations and register of contracts to make their records available to the public on the internet. Uh, not every donations, of course, need to be shown, but higher than uh, 10,000 zloty, and 10,000 zloty is about 2.5 thousand dollars now. And um, this regulation was also a problem for our National Election uh, Commission, because uh, now it is not possible for the Commission to verify whether the political party have uh, fulfilled the obligation and if not, to impose penalties. Uh, and and uh, at the time, um, I had case as attorney at law, and this case concerned uh, the release under access to public information of contract and donation register. Um, the introduction of this uh, register of contracts and contributions was supposed to improve disclosure of political party uh, finances in Poland. Uh, theoretically, uh, large parties can handle um, the release of information. However, this case um, we are discussing has shown that large parties too sometimes try not to disclose their income. They should do so without um, a summons according to the new law uh, on political parties on their websites. And my client, he is a very engaged citizen, uh, he asked parties which register were not available online to make them public. Uh, he was mailing, calling, um, he submitted a FOIA request, uh, also complained for inaction, and um, um, the major Polish political party uh, had failed to release the requested data. Uh, despite the fact that they um, have had proposed the amendments. Uh, what was worst, they were trying also to intimidate my client during this procedure. And you can see that also on the screen. Um, it was not a kind of slap, it was um, request uh, an award of cost. Uh, and now uh, an administrative court ruling was issued in the case last week, uh, stating the parties in action in this regard, but the verdict is not final uh, yet. Uh, after that, we were wondering with Anna, uh, how is it elsewhere? And the countries of the Visegrad group have many similar rules on political uh, financing, but nevertheless, they are not the same. Our research shows some differences. On the screen, you can see only some basic instruments to ensure transparency. Um, all Visegrad countries, according to a regulation of political finance indicator, are categorized as um, a strongly, strongly regulated, sorry, uh, the highly Poland. Uh, but if you go into the details, you can see that in Poland and also in Hungary, for example, they are unclear regulations uh, on third party funding. Um, we made some assumptions um, about the relationship, um, first of all, between uh, the legal regulation of political funding and the availability of data, and we assume um, no relation between variables, and also between um, the state of democracy and uh, the availability of data, uh, availability of data on political uh, funding. Um, and um, to the test this um, availability of, that, of data, we made a form with uh, questions that we sent to a dozen organizations from the physical, Visegrad countries. Unfortunately, um, the return rate of the questionnaires was low. Uh, as you can see uh, on the presentation, we have received six responses. Uh, that was three responses from Poland and the other countries, uh, three more. We are trying to get uh, more responses, at least from 
uh, at least two from each country. So we can see move on with our research. Mm, we are waiting for responses, of course, but also looking for other ways uh, to check the availability of data, such as official documents, maybe court cases, maybe reports also. But even without finishing uh, our research, um, we are already convinced uh, that these um, beautiful regulations are not enough. Uh, if there's no data available, and um, if um, it, it, if is if sorry, if there is no engaged citizens uh, to bring it out, uh, it's very bad for integrity uh, of the elections. Um, if you have any que any question, any suggestion or advice, uh, what else we should focus on maybe in our research, we would uh, really appreciate it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Um, and with that, we'll go ahead and turn it over to um, our next presentation, which is the uh, paper by um, Madeline, Louisa, and Henry. Yes, thanks very much. Um, let me share the screen. Yeah, you can see this okay. All right, so a uh, very sunny day here in The Hague. It's afternoon. And uh, it's actually a very warm day, so I hope we're not melting away in front of the screen. Um, all right, we'll be focusing on a very specific case, um, on the Swiss case, a small country, but that has been experiencing actually quite a lot of uh, stability over the years. We look at the very beginning of the uh, confederation, as it's called, and go up to 2022. Uh, we are three authors, and I'll give some of the background, and then I'll turn over to Henry Bury uh, for some of the analysis. If you uh, look at uh, Switzerland, um, one of the characteristics is that there is a lot of um, voting on referendums, and maybe it's uh, one of the cases where you see this um, most frequently. There have been almost 700 national level referendums held since the very beginning uh, of the Confederation. Uh, there's been all kinds of demographic changes. And of course, um, people have also wondered, you know, what kind of effects potentially uh, turn out and actually rejection rates. Uh, our paper also follows a bit uh, in that tradition, but also takes a slightly different angle. Uh, what is important is that it's a very um, decentralized political organization. Uh, there are 26 cantons in total, of which includes six half cantons. And if you look at the provisions in the federal constitution, it's actually that there's a lot of sovereignty uh, of these cantons, also in terms of uh, tax matters. And uh, there's, of course, representation also in what's called the Council of States or the Second Chamber of Parliament, where they all have equal uh, representation. There's different types of referendums. Um, they're mandatory, uh, for example, like membership in collective security organizations, supranational institutions, um, but then also optional um, referenda that can be requested by eight of the cantons. And I think one uh, aspect that's maybe not all that much known is that the citizens can request referenda. Um, Especially if you look at laws issued by parliament, 50,000 citizens can actually ask that the referendum is held on this. And 100,000 Swiss eligible voters can request changes to the constitution, which I think is a very, well, very special uh, feature and that probably deserves some attention. Um, feature also institutionally is that um, some of the referendums need a double majority. Um, and that implies that needs to be a majority of the cantons and, of course, a majority of the voters. But it can, of course, happen, and it has happened again in 2020, that there is a majority of Swiss voters that actually accepts a referendum, but then it fails because of the majority of cantons. And I think this is a phenomenon we've also seen in other contexts, thinking about the U.S. presidential elections um, um, when Donald Trump made it in the end. Um, then also, of course, um, there have been reflection about why um, there could have been um, more, more referenda turned down over time, especially in the 90s. Uh, that was very often related to the frequency of these referenda held, but actually our 
research will show that this is maybe no longer uh, necessarily the case. Um, so I'll maybe skip uh, these aspects. Um, obviously, there's quite a lot of literature kind of brainstorming and, and, and analyzing potential factors that affect the outcomes. Um, here, this is um, uh, a kind of a very easy way to look at institutional features. Uh, a couple of authors have argued that um, it got easier over time uh, to form a blocking minority uh, in terms of population. And I think these two graphs are kind of neat. Uh, one is for uh, 1850 and the other for 1990. Um, what we actually do, and this is just an um, easy analysis in the beginning of the paper, we, we um, construct Lorentz curves where we look at the distribution, uh, the number of cantons here on the vertical axis and on the horizontal, the cumulative percentage of voters. And if you just look at, um, let's say, the shares of the smallest cantons, you can actually see what a blocking minority would have been. So in an extreme case, if all the voters of the small cantons would all have voted no, for example, whereas everyone else voted yes, then this blocking minority could have been around 15% of the population, which is, of course, a, a pretty radical. It didn't happen in, in, in that radical way. Uh, but what we actually see is that if we go up to the 1990s and we plot the cantons again in a similar way, then this blocking minority stays uh, quite uh, stable. So that argument maybe doesn't hold that much, uh, that the very institutional features related to double majority uh, would have directly affected uh, outcome. Um, I'll now turn over to Henry uh, Bore, who will talk a bit more about the analysis that we do in the paper, kind of following up on the basic framework that I just presented. Yes, so we wanted to look more recently at Swiss referendum and see how uh, kind of patterns and trends that had been described in earlier literature had followed through uh, into the 21st century. So we used a, a data set from the Center on Research on Direct Democracy, which um, compile really excellently these data sets on countries that use more direct democracy systems, and they have a really complete one on Switzerland, which we drew from. It contains all of their referendums, both national and subnational. Uh, we wanted to focus only on the national level referendums, so we immediately kind of cut out um, any uh, subnational referendums. And then there were some with some missing information which needed to be removed or where it could be supplemented. We took that from the Swiss Federal Office. For example, the referendums held in 2022, uh, we input the information for that and we took out the information where there wasn't a number of registered voters, for example. And that left us with 638 uh, referendums to uh, analyze. We then constructed three additional variables, quite simple ones. The first is turnout, which is all of the votes, including uh, blank votes, invalid votes, um, divided by the registered voters that were um, listed in the data set. The margin of each referendum, which is simply the number of yes votes minus the number of no votes and the margin as a percentage of registered voters, which we wanted to uh, be able to calculate and look over time uh, what the margin for each referendum was, ignoring uh, enfranchisement and the kind of population increase. Um, and so this keeps it kind of stable with those. Um, and we analyze the kind of trends over time via local regression lines for the non-quant people. That just means that the line doesn't have to go straight, it can curve. So if trends change over time, it uh, keeps it in mind the kind of uh, sequential uh, observations. And then to test this properly statistically, we use two sample t-tests uh, to look at these kind of overall. So if we go on to the next slide. Um, so what we see, my computer is very, very slow, so it might take a minute for it to load on my screen, but we see that uh, we have this kind of differing turnout over time, and this is colored based on whether the referendum succeeds or fails. So what you can see from this first graph is that pretty much generally over the time period, so 1848 to 2022, which um, is as long as you can go in Switzerland, really, um, you have this pretty consistent um, gap between those referendums which fail tend to have slightly higher turnout, and we calculated this uh, in general on average as being around 3% higher 
for those referendums that fail rather than those that pass. What we see in recent years is that uh, turnout has both looks like it's tending to increase again after a decrease noted in the 1990s and that this kind of uh, the difference between referendum failing and having higher turnout um, has been diminished and may even be returning. The uncertainty bars are much too close together to really say anything um, too much about that, but we can see that it is definitely compared to earlier years, there seems to be a changing trend, which I think we're not quite sure about what's going on there. Uh, there's probably a range of factors involved. So if we go on to the next slide. And I really, in this one, we should see um, the referendum type that, uh, and we as well have the kind of average turnout for each referendum put into a box plot. Um, and in this, you can see the kind of differences between each type of referendum, whether it's a citizen's initiative, a mandatory optional, or the, the kind of counter proposal. And we see a generally pretty similar level of, of turnout. Ooh, I think this is, I don't know, can we go on to the next slide? Sorry, I've... My computer... Yeah, we did. Computer, I think what You're I see is about... <laughs> behind. Oh, thank you very much. Um, and so we see a pretty similar kind of turnout for each type of referendum. Um, although we do see that citizens initiatives do on average see the highest level of turnout and interestingly they are the most frequently rejected nine times out of ten really almost which I think is very interesting that these are initiatives kind of demanded by the citizenry which they then overwhelmingly go on to reject whereas the mandatory referendums that think the referendums that kind of happen automatically they tend to pass actually most of the time. Um, and we can see that this difference in the turnout is, is statistically significant, and it's about 4% higher on citizens' initiatives as compared directly to mandatory referendums. So if we go on to the next slide, and here we're looking at the margins of each referenda over time. And what we see is that the margin that, um, referenda pass or fail by is, is quite stable over time. It tends to be around 13 to 15% on average. Um, and we don't actually see any difference in the margins for whether they pass or fail. And in doing that, we just, we just square the margins so negatives become positives. And we don't notice any difference in between referendums that pass. So those that are rejected are not outright rejected by a stronger, heavier margin than those that are failed. Um, if you're very eagle-eyed, you'll notice that there are some red dots, those that have failed that are above that 0% threshold. And those are the referendums which have passed the popular vote but failed on this cantonal level. Um, and you'll notice that there are some that are extremely rejected, but most tend to be, again, in this kind of 10 to 20% sort of level. And it does sort of appear to be um, less varying over time. Um, it may even be coming slightly um, close to the margins, but that's not something we can quite say at this stage. So on to the next final slide. And just to conclude with what we've kind of discussed, We've seen an increase uh, in turnout in recent years, which um, follows this decreasing turnout that was noted in previous literature. Um, we noticed that popular initiatives, despite being kind of demanded by the citizenry, but by a very small uh, proportion, only 50,000 citizens um, can make a citizens initiative referendum occur, but they tend to get overwhelmingly rejected most of the time. Um, we've seen there's been a kind of reordering of the cantons as well, in which have lost influence and gained influence in terms of the kind of demographic uh, changes that affect um, the dynamics in Swiss referendums. Um, but we don't obviously see these kind of blocking minorities occurring in um, the actual referendums when you see there is a one that has passed the popular vote but failed, it is, it is generally um, a lot tighter than what the theory could allow for. Um, and so we've gone beyond kind of overall the kind of demographic factors that are explained in 
um, explaining outcomes in Swiss referendums. And we've looked at the type of referendum itself, its initiation procedure, and how voters kind of interact with those referendums as having some connection with um, the chances and the outcomes of these referendums. And we've shown that turnout rates change with the different referenda types, and also the acceptance rates change uh, based on the referendum type, but we don't see the same uh, association of acceptance rates with the margins um, on which referendums pass or fail by. Um, so that, I believe, is all we have time for, and I want to thank you for your attention. All right, thank you so much. So we have two presentations left. Uh, our next one is from Joseph uh, Claver. Great. Okay, let's share the screen. Okay. How does that look? Good. Good. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so my name is Joseph Claver. I recently um, finished my PhD work at the University of Michigan, and I'm currently um, doing a postdoc at the University of Passau in uh, Bavaria. So this paper um, is meant to be sort of a, per a first step in evaluating the effectiveness of France's system of election dispute resolution. Um, and France, I think, is in kind of an interesting case because the elections are sort of in the in the global sense, you know, is um, um, high quality, and yet France also frequently um, cancels uh, district level um, election contests uh, to the National Assembly. And so what I'm interested in is sort of do the frequently canceled contests and the ensuing by-elections that are used to fill them represent sort of important checks on actual sort of electoral problems or fraud, or do they simply tend to recreate the results of the general election for better or for worse? Um, and to look at this, I sort of I leverage the presence of there's are a good number of other types of by-elections as well in France. And so I'm, um, I use the presence of these to evaluate the extent to which dispute-induced by-elections might differ from contests organized for other reasons. Okay. So although relatively little studied, at least in comparison to uh, general elections, by-elections are common in countries that rely on single-member districts. Um, in France, they're part uh, particularly common as the method for resolving uh, disputed elections frequently generates these contests, generally on the order of about six to eight um, in the aftermath of every national assembly election. Um, since these contests are so common, um, I think it makes sense to understand the dynamics of uh, political behavior and competition here, because if these um, dynamics are substantively different than the conditions of a general election, then this can raise questions related to democratic accountability and sort of what is actually being accomplished um, with these by-elections. Um, and so, yeah, um, I think that one of the reasons for sort of the relatively scant attention they have received is that they generally involve um, one seat at a time, unless obviously multiple by-elections are being contested on the same day, and so are generally not decisive in the sense of deciding which party has a majority in a national parliamentary body. Um, however, despite this, they, um, play, they still play a role in shaping media narratives surrounding the political status quo, and in um, circumstances where the governing majority is relatively slim, they can either sort of, um, sort of strengthen or substantively weaken that majority. Okay. So, um, let's see. Yeah, and then again, the, um, uh, in the French case, it also, in other um, countries, it's much less common, but then they, um, they're often, uh, we often see these um, by-elections used to fill um, seats. And of course, these uh, by-elections can also happen for um, other reasons as well, um, due to um, representatives resigning due to illness, representatives um, resign, I mean, dying in office. In France in, as well, um, occasionally, um, people or representatives win um, elections to other elected bodies, um, sometimes the, um, the uh, French Senate or other offices that cause them to have to um, lose their seat or they join the government. Um, and in order to become a minister, you also leave your seat. Um, 
And so again, alongside the uh, um, by elections caused by canceled elections, we see um, uh, that there's a lot of other ones as well. Okay, so, so what are some existing explanations for uh, political behavior in by elections? Um, so there are several sort of broad theories about what might drive this behavior. The first is that by elections, because they occur sort of outside the context of a large general election campaign and alongside a sitting government attempting to implement their sort of preferred policy program. That's, um, th there's one argument is that these contests are driven mostly by essentially local sentiments relating to the actions of national level politicians. So rather than primarily re reflecting local issues, these contests are best understood as a, um, the, per this argument, these contests are best understood as a barometer of local opinions on national politics. Um, however, other factors are also clearly relevant at times. Um, By-elections might also reflect district level concerns, whether the dominant issue is local politics, local um, opinion on say a particular um, scandal or um, something related to the, the specific candidates um, involved. Again, if there was a um, someone you know, like resigned because of a scandal or in this case was sort of accused of being involved in um, illegal electoral practices. Um, and finally, um, some other studies have shown that these contests represent sort of distinct opportunities for political new, um, newcomers and otherwise marginalized political forces. Um, for a number of reasons. So the uh, potential for political change is, um, and a big part of this is because they frequently have significantly lower turnout than uh, general elections. And so the relative number of votes required to unseat somebody is smaller or unseat a party is smaller. So the um, potential for political change, I argue, is especially relevant in by-elections organized as a result of um, a uh, canceled um, election because um, through the dispute resolution process, because again, just as a matter of like, um, uh, because of electoral wrongdoing, because I expect voters basically did react negatively to um, these types of happenings. And so I think France offers an interesting case to, once again, to investigate this issue due to the combination of the high number of by-elections that occur yearly and the fact that so many of these are initiated through the electoral dispute process. So I'll, I'll talk um, just kind of briefly about the election dispute process itself. So um, uh, the one thing is that the, the process is very open to citizens and candidates alike. Um, in some countries, standing to file a, an electoral dispute is limited to candidates, but in France, all voters are entitled to file such a dispute in their district without any filing fee or deposit. This is in contrast to other systems, um, such as the one used in the UK, where you have to um, submit a sizable deposit before you can sort of file such a dispute in court. Um, and I believe that this contributes to the relatively high frequency of disputes, because there's, again, on the order, like there's hundreds of disputes filed in the um, aftermath of each National Assembly election. These disputes are uh, resolved by the Constitutional Council, which is the top constitutional authority in France. Um, and in addition to its capacity as the so-called electoral judge. Um, and then one of the sort of thornier aspects of designing a system to mediate election disputes is how to create a process that can um, reason be reasonably seen as impartial on questions that are essential, that um, in some ways will always involve sort of um, political questions and sort of a, like a balance of power issues. It's very difficult to consider these types of cases out sort of the specific um, political consequences engendered when you're canceling an election. So this is also a concern with general constitutional questions, but it's even more stark as it relates to um, elections. So to help ameliorate these concerns, um, council members are uh, nominated to nine year terms by legislative leaders and the president and one third of the council is replaced every three years, which allows the uh, composition to regularly shift according to and sort of at least in theory sort of shift um, in ways that sort of mirror electoral results because they're being replaced by um, elected uh, representatives. Um, and the process is um, the, and the process of sort of when there's an opening isn't randomized as it is in places with uh, lifetime appointment. So um, now we have here. Um, uh, let's see. Um, now we have um, 
This is just a graph that shows the uh, number of by-elections in each year since uh, the late 80s, which is when the data set that I um, collected started based on data availability. In yellow, you can see um, are the um, by-elections caused by things other than a canceled election. Um, and the one, the uh, purple bars are um, by-elections as a result of um, canceled contests from the Constitutional Council. And the uh, dotted lines, the, the dotted vertical lines uh, are the uh, co correspond to um, elections to the National Assembly. So you can see that generally the um, by-elections to replace uh, canceled elections tend to happen early in legislative terms. Okay, so I'll get briefly to my um, uh, analysis model. So to address this question, I use data from all the by-elections in France since 1988, um, um, collected very, uh, the, uh, the data on this, the like election data and other data related to this myself. Um, and I use a sort of a very um, standard negative binomial regression model to look at um, with the, where the outcome variable is simply, did the seat change from one party to another? So looking at um, looking at in uh, the seat before the by-election, um, was it occupied by a um, different party after the um, ensuing um, uh, uh, by-election. So was there sort of a political change induced by this um, particular by-election? So in terms of my explanatory variables, I simply look at the type of by-election, which um, I run various uh, forms of this model in um, the paper, but for this one, I'll talk about the um, most um, sort of parsimonious one. And that's basically, I reduce it to um, two types of by-election. There are those caused by an election dispute and other by-elections. Also, I look at, um, because of the importance of incumbency for things like this, I also look at whether the um, person running in the um, by-election is an incumbent. Um, I look at the original margin of victory in the, from the general election, because um, this is relevant because in particular, many of the elections um, canceled due to an election dispute were quite close um, in the first case because of the um, rules about sort of under what circumstances you um, are obligated to cancel an election. And so um, I just wanted to, um, again, make sure that it, um, to see whether you know, if if the party, um, if somebody else won the ensuing election, like how how big of a change are we looking at here? Um, and then I also include um, election specific fixed effects that correspond to the general election, just to um, again make sure that in case there was some sort of big national narrative happening at the time, that this sort of wasn't generating big um, uh, sort of anti. Uh, you know, anti-government or like anti um, uh, in, uh, any specific sentiment against sort of people that were currently um, in office at the time. So then um, there's a full regression table in the available in the paper, but I thought that I would just summarize here. And um, I calculated incident rate ratios to um, basically look at sort of the uh, increase in um, likelihood of uh, a shift in party power, uh, depending uh, on the different, um, whether it was uh, canceled by the Constitutional Council or was some other sort of by-election. And we see that by-elections generated by the election dispute process are about as four times as likely to lead to a shift in party power as other types of by-elections. And by that, I mean, again, the person that wins the by-election belongs to a different political party than the person that originally won the, uh, that seat in the general election. We see that incumbency is also, um, in, incumbents um, tend to, similar to um, their standing in general elections, tend to do better than non-incumbents in by-elections. Um, interestingly, we see that margin of victory in the uh, prior general election is not uh, significantly associated with shifts in party power, 
which is, um, again, I think potentially uh, likely um, due to the fact that you often get a somewhat different electorate in the by-election because the um, by-elections are associated with pretty strong decreases in overall turnout. Um, and so I think that there's, there's um, numerous sort of um, potential interpretations of the increased likelihood of partisan change as a result of uh, the uh, election dispute process. So one possible interpretation is that the original result was in fact tainted by um, you know, significant electoral problems and the partisan reversal that came about via the by-election accurately re reflects sort of the sentiments of the district at this time. Um, Another um, interpretation is that the initial result was ultimately correct, but the candidate is still um, in, correct in the sense of accurately reflecting the will of the citizens in that district at the time, but the candidate is still being punished because again, they've sort of been tarred um, with the, um, this uh, having their election canceled, even if it was sort of outside of their control. Um, like in one case, for instance, somebody lost um, uh, lost their seat because a mayor in uh, a small town in their district um, posted something uh, on Facebook um, during the campaign blackout period, completely outside the control of the, the candidate themselves. Um, and then, of course, it, it's obviously also um, Again, possible that um, it's sort of somewhere in the middle where the um, the uh, it's I mean there's sort of again because it's not always the same people voting it's difficult to sort of um, disentangle whether um, what is correct here which is why I think it is sort of interesting from a, a democratic accountability standpoint in that you know obviously like if in an election is significantly tainted by problems clearly something has to be done but i think that um it's interesting to sort of think through sort of what makes the most sense and of course it is always possible that this higher likelihood of reversal is due to a factor that i have not yet considered and if anyone has thoughts on that i would love to discuss them during the um question and answer session and so that i'll um finish my presentation and uh can move on to our next paper all right, thank you so much. So that brings us to our final paper, uh, which is the paper by David and Christina. Take it away. Okay, give me one second to share my screen. Okay. Welcome everybody. Um, I know that I wanna make sure we get to the questions. Um, and I know that yeah, I'm not sure if, if saving the best for last is applicable here based on all the great presentations we've had before us, but we'll certainly, Christian and I will do our best. My name is David Levine, and I'm the Senior Elections Integrity Fellow with the Alliance for Securing Democracy, the German Marshall Fund, um, which is a, just real quickly is a nonpartisan initiative that developed comprehensive strategies to deter, defend against, and use or raise the costs on autocratic efforts to undermine and interfere in democratic institutions. And our paper, um, I'm thrilled to be presenting today with my co-author and colleague, Krisha Sikora. Um, and just before Krisha gets into the paper, I just want to make a couple of very brief remarks. First, um, for those that don't know her, Krisha has a background in right-wing populism, disinformation, and democratic decline in Central and Eastern Europe that has enabled her to help co-author important ASD reports on topics raising, ranging from autocratic corruption ahead of Poland's 2023 fall election, to China's economic coercive tactics towards Lithuania to today's paper. She's a valued member of the ASD election integrity team, and I encourage all the folks at this conference to extend her the same warm courtesy you've extended me during my previous appearances. And then secondly, I just wanted to thank the Electoral Integrity Project and everyone else who helped make the conference a reality, including the organizers and the, sponsor and the sponsors. It's a real joy both to be here and to hear what so many wonderful folks are doing to defend election integrity across the globe. Krisha, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, David, for the introduction. And I just want to express uh, or echo David in, in expressing my appreciation to EIP for giving us the opportunity to present our research today. Although the United States has many safeguards in place to ensure the integrity of its elections, like any large and complex system, elections are also vulnerable to mistakes. While the 2020 and the 2022 general elections 
are widely considered to have been both secure and accurate. A few jurisdictions did make mistakes while conducting them. And these mistakes were then exploited to support unfounded claims of fraud, to try and overturn fair elections, and to further erode trust in US democracy. And the images on the slide are just a few examples of how bad faith actors have tried to exploit and weaponize election administration mistakes. And, and just to sort of build on what Krisha just said, the, this problem is significant. Um, you know, we see bad faith actors actively trying to undermine election systems. Um, and and this, the consequences uh, are sweeping. Um, we see lots of legislation that's being introduced to increase the risk of meddling in the vote counting process. Um, we've seen, of course, in the 2022 midterms, we saw local officials in Arizona, Nevada, and Pennsylvania, among other states, that attempted to block the certification of election results on little more than conjecture. And we've also seen some states, for example, like Florida, establish task forces to investigate speculative fraud allegations rather than supporting election officials and their voters. It is worth noting, right, to, just for a little bit of positive, that we have seen since 2020 election workers, well, we, we've seen some states try and work to sort of protect election officials, um, but that still hasn't stopped election workers from leaving their positions at a rapid rate. Um, you know, in Arizona, 10 out of 15 counties have lost their top election official, um, including Republicans, Democrats, and independents. Six of Georgia's most populous counties, rec representing nearly a third of all active voters, had new election directors in the 2022 cycle. And across Nevada, over half of the state's counties had turnover from the 2020 election through the midterms. Um, and so, you know, the, the issues here are significant. We see efforts to cast down the integrity of elections, efforts to introduce legislation that's predicated on bad faith claims that in some cases was the same kind of stuff that was used to try and subvert the 2020 presidential election and contributed to the January 6, 2021 insurrection. Um, and the consequences have been stark. To gain better insight into this problem, our paper examines administration mistakes uh, made in recent elections and surveys how these errors were then weaponized to undermine elections. In our paper, David and I evaluate three case studies, um, the 2020 presidential election in Antrim County, as well as the 2022 midterms in both Harris County and Maricopa County. And in each case study, we outline three things. First, the administration error and how it occurred. Second, the actions each jurisdiction took to address the error and including its communication with the public. And lastly, the fallout from these errors, including how bad faith actors exploited the mistake to cast doubt on the integrity of the election. And while our paper explores three case studies, for the purposes of time, we'll primarily just go into depth on the Harris County case study. And just to build on um, uh, Chris's point, you know, not only are we we're going to focus on Harris County because of time, but frankly, because of relevance. Um, as recently as yesterday, uh, Harris County, a Harris County attorney announced that the county was filing a lawsuit against Texas state officials to challenge the constitutionality of a new law that would eliminate the position of the Harris County election administrator effective September 1st of this year, right? This lawsuit and what triggered it were fueled in part by what occurred during Harris County's administration of the 2022 midterms. Um, and to be clear, and this slide sort of shows, there were problems, right? Harris County has had issues in the past in its elections. 2022 in some respects was no different. We saw that the county experienced paper ballot shortages, machine malfunctions, and delays in opening polling places, among other things. Um, but what is different uh, in this instance, as opposed to perhaps what we've seen in the past, was that um, the solutions or the actions taken by some following these mistakes wasn't simply to provide oversight and support um, jurisdictions to better administer their elections, but were efforts geared toward, frankly, um, either by intention or had the effect of trying to undermine um, and cast out on legitimacy of elections in, in Harris County. Um, you know, it's worth noting that Harris County, as well as others like the Houston Chronicle, investigated what, during, what took place during the midterms, and they found a bevy of mistakes in need of fixing, right? 
And we touch on that in our paper. We talk about the lack of tools to identify where problems existed. We look at uh, issues with regards to voting machines that became inoperable. Um, but there was nothing that came close to affecting the outcomes in any of the races that were administered. And that's the throughput um, that, that goes through all three of these case studies. And, and rather than passing legislation, for example, that might perhaps fund the periodic review of elections in Harris County and elsewhere with an eye toward improving them, we saw many Texas elected officials that took counterproductive actions following the midterms with an eye toward partisan or political gain. Um, and that included filing lawsuits, seeking to overturn election results with little evidence, making false claims that the county's election administration problems were politically motivated and perhaps intentional, and of course, passing legislation that I just touched on earlier that abolished the election administrator position and authorized the Tec Texas Secretary of State to order oversight of the county elections office if, for instance, a, case, a, a complaint is filed or there's cause to believe that there's a reoccurring pattern of problems involving election administration or voter registration. And I want to be clear for any of you thinking, OK, well, perhaps this is something that is broader, more broad applicable, more broader applicability than in Harris County. Right. The provision to eliminate the election administrator role um, was had a population threshold. Um, and a date by which was only could have been applicable to Harris County. And that's, of course, not only problematic from an election administration, an election integrity perspective, it also has legal potential problems as well as the yesterday's lawsuit demonstrated. So drawing from our case studies, we developed two buckets of recommendations. The first bucket of recommendations seek to reduce the likelihood of mistakes from happening. However, there's some instances in which mistakes will be unforeseen or unpreventable. So the second bucket seeks to mitigate the impact of mistakes with if they do occur. And together, uh, this is an all-encompassing effort to better combat this problem. Yeah, and, and just to sort of build on build on Krisha's points, one of the things that we focus on in this paper is how to better prepare election workers. And so you see here, we call for standardized training and the recruitment of, of poll workers. We appreciate on the one hand that US jurisdictions have dramatically different resources, um, but we also know that there can be minimum baselines that help improve the election administration experience. Um, several years ago, the Bipartisan Presidential Commission on Election Administration, for example, put out a recommendation that nobody should have more, should have to take more than 30 minutes to vote. Uh, and in that vein, um, based on, you know, what we see election officials dealing with um, from bad faith actors and others. We, we think that um, all poll workers um, should be able to have at least four hours of poll worker training, right? Um, at least every two years, but ideally before each election. We also think it's really important at a time when we see an exodus of election workers for there to be succession plans in place to ensure that new election workers are equipped to take over the management of elections. Uh, and of course, I touched on that a little earlier with regards to a few states, just how significant this issue is. And of course, we, one of the other recommendations we, we touch on and go on in depth on is, is the need for more election jurisdictions to be engaging in tabletop exercises and mock elections um, with regards to different scenarios they may encounter right in the run up to an on election day. Um, you know, it's... It, this paper is in part about bringing awareness to the problem of bad faith actors exploiting mistakes to try and falsely cast doubt on the legitimacy of elections. And not only is it important to be aware of this phenomenon, but it's also important to be mindful of what other jurisdictions have experienced related to this and to go through exercises so that in the event you come into similar or deal with similar problems, you know how to respond. In addition to recommendations that better prepare election officials, we also need to bolster election environments in a way that prevents mistakes from happening. First, we need to enact policy that encourages accuracy over speed and vote counting. Election officials are often pressured from the media, political parties, and the public to publish election results quickly. This has led some states to set unrealistic and often onerous timelines for counting votes, which then creates an environment more vulnerable to making mistakes. 
For example, in Texas, state requirements to continuously count ballots contributed to Harris County's failure to include 10,000 ballots in its original tabulation of unofficial um, results in the 2022 primaries. Um, and election workers attributed this problem to having worked multiple 40 hour shifts with minimal sleep to meet these state deadlines. Rather, policymakers should try to widen vote counting timelines in order to make it easier for election workers to comfortably count, count ballots. Um, in line with a recent law in Maryland, we suggest giving election administrators eight days before an election to pre-canvas ballots. Additionally, we recommend setting election certification deadlines no earlier than 14 days after an election. Um, additionally, it is important to increase nonpartisan election observation. Credible nonpartisan election observation not only helps uh, increase public confidence by promoting transparency, but it can import it could provide important feedback uh, to better secure and improve election processes. For example, domestic nonpartisan observers can monitor for irregularities in real time by alerting election headquarters to issues such as electioneering, supply shortages, or tampering of voting equipment. And this can help election officials uh, respond to complaints and concerns in a more timely manner. And because we're, we're, we're low on time, I'm just going to briefly note that this report touches on some uh, additional tools that we think can be helpful in pushing back on efforts to subvert elections. We think where, where possible, jurisdictions should be looking to expand the use of post-election audits. Um, there are many jurisdictions doing traditional ones, but there could be more that are doing statistically significant ones, particularly prior to the certification of results. And as well as um, we should be looking to get landscape analysis tools in the hands of more election offices to track election day problems, which was something that arose in Harris County during the midterms. And lastly, our last set of recommendations aim to improve uh, communications. Uh, considering our current information environment that we live in, which is defined by disinformation and polarization, all election offices should create a crisis communications plan to address um, emergencies, including um, mistakes. These plans should be developed well in advance of a mistake or an emergency happening, um, but it should address how the election office will acknowledge the mistake uh, in a timely manner and circulate truthful information to the public. Uh, Maricopa County is a good example of an office that has um, a well thought out crisis communications plan. During the 2022 midterm elections, um, the county experienced um, a problem in which the ballot tabulators were unable to read uh, ballots that were printed on site. And immediately when this um, problem was brought to the county's attention, uh, they posted a short video on social media in which they explained the problem as well as informed voters of their voting options. And this immediate transparency is crucial for dispelling uh, disinformation that might arise from the mistake and ensuring that the public has truthful information. Uh, lastly, serious mistakes, um, such as the mistakes that uh, we encountered in our three case studies, they require after action reports. These reports must evaluate the scope of impact of the mistake, including specifying the extent to which the mistake may have uh, turned away voters or impacted the results. And additionally, to help restore public faith, it's crucial that these reports also outline how the jurisdiction will ensure that the problem doesn't happen again. So thank you so much for listening.